Hello, this is Good Guy Boris and you're listening to episode number two of Influencer Podcast. Today I have a guest, Andrea Baldini, a philosopher and associate professor of aesthetic and art theory. With him we're going to speak on the topic of copyright, copyright on graffiti and street art. If you want to jump into the main subject, go to minute 38 directly, otherwise enjoy listening. First of all, thank you for being the guest of this show. Um, thank you for agreeing. Thank you for your time. I would I would say that we should start uh, by introducing yourself in a short, in the shortest way you can introduce yourself. You know, so I'm I'm good for being a philosopher in terms of being short. But philosophers are not famous for being very quick. So, well, my name is Andrea Baldini. As I just mentioned, I'm a, I'm a philosopher by training and trade. I work primarily in uh, philosophy of art, aesthetics, um, well, with you know, interest in visual culture and, and uh, well, urban studies, you might say. And of course, I have also an interest in uh, matters re related to the law at the intersection with, the, you might say, creativity and the arts. I did my, well, I have two PhDs, one in, from Italy and the other one from the US. I studied at Temple University with a Fulbright scholarship, and then I moved to China after being having lived in the US for six years, where I started working at uh, Nanjing University. As mm -hmm. a doc first at the Institute for Advanced Studies and then as associate professor at uh, the School of Arts in Nanjing University, uh, where I teach uh, mostly theoretical courses, but also a little bit of historical courses uh, in the arts and cultural heritage, uh, cu you know, foundations of curation. And um, I'm also the director of the Sino Italian, uh, NJU Sino Italian. What no, means this? NJU Center for Sino Italian Cultural Studies. Well, the center mm -hmm. is basically the a cultural hub of the University of Nanjing University that oversees all the uh, activities that we have of exchange and cooperations with Italian institutions and uh, what promotes a certain cultural activities. Um, we have a, a residency program where we invite every year a number of artists. As many as we can afford, <laughs> and, yeah. uh, and uh, well, we promote uh, exhibitions and uh, other, you know, ways in which actually our students can become able to produce culture before they actually graduate. Because of course, uh, it's uh, always a great concern. Well, yeah. having students that uh, work with uh, with culture, but you want them to actually have a job. You don't want them to live like I did. <laughs> <laughs> you, don't them, you don't want them to have to travel the world in order to get a job. I mean, for me, it's okay. I don't complain. I, by, by all means, it's my choice and I embrace it. But not everybody wants to live that. And it's nice to have a choice. And so we try to do that. Uh, you have a choice. Yeah. So what? Well, that's about it. I am... Well. Uh, okay. So we... We first met last year, or this week. Okay, I think it was last year, the one and only time we met. It was uh, in Lisbon. You were invited. I was invited to this uh, conference that we had to speak about, uh, mostly about graffiti. And uh, I heard your talk with Enrico. Uh, you, were, you were talking about the subject of uh, copyright. And what was uh, really interesting for me was that I already have heard the work of Enrico. I know him. Uh, I know what, uh, more or less what he's interested in and his point of view. Then uh, for the first time I discovered you and I discovered your point of view. And I saw that actually the talk for the people who didn't hear it's, it was a talk about copyright and there was, a, how do you call the smart people, how do you call it? There was the thesis and the antithesis or there was the pro and against the copyright. And your position in this conversation was copyright. So just to, do a small, to recap this and to say why I invited you, one, I want to, want to speak to you. It's like, 
okay, the past years we discovered a lot of uh, copyright cases appearing, uh, copyright cases on graffiti and mostly on illegal graffiti because, okay, let's say graffiti on a legal wall, they have been commissioned, you have the papers, etc, etc. But graffiti on a legal wall, for me as a graffiti writer myself, and most of the people, it becomes a bit paradoxical, I believe, that somebody would search for a copyright for something that was not intended as a commercial work and something that uh, just appear in a commercial project. But anyway, this opinion, everybody can have it. And the thing is what I heard from your part, part was the was very interesting and this is why I want to do the, this talk with you and then with, with Enrico and I separated in two different uh, parts so everybody can have the highlight and the and the time to say his point of view and I think it will be interesting if we exchange this uh, information after I'm done with both of you and then we can maybe do a, a conference together if it makes sense if, it, if it's clear on on a solo case we let it solo but Okay, this big subject of graffiti and copyright, before we dive into the main topic, I would like to know uh, the things, okay, you introduce yourself for me, what is interesting and I think for the people to understand is like, first of all, what is your relation with graffiti? How comes that all that you said until now, all the, all the work that you do, what is the relation that you come with, with graffiti? Mm -hmm. So actually, I, I came to be interested in graffiti. I mean, in the sense of that uh, was, uh, in some senses, in some important senses, it was my research, it was my uh, intellectual interests that draw me to think and study and you know just get in touch with the scene. Uh, so I actually wrote on my dissertation on public art. So I'm generally interested in the relationship between, uh, you might say, the domains of the domain of creativity and all other domains of human action, in particular mm -hmm. politics. And I've been very interested in understanding how creativity can shape uh, public space, the function of public space, how we live in public spaces, uh, how we transform. You know, you know, basically a square or a street into a public space. Uh, how we can practice that mm -hmm. in public. Mm -hmm. So when I wrote the dissert my dissertation, actually there was, um, you know, one of the comments that I received when I was working on it, and they asked me, why don't you talk about, well, in general, street art. Now, just to be clear, and we take it mm -hmm. out, of the, we take it out of the of the way. Uh, I am one of the very few who actually thinks that graffiti is the uh, original and most radical form of street art. In the sense, what's interesting about graffiti is what's interesting about street art and not the other way around. So every okay. time that we think that, the, for me, the street art is a value, it's because it takes it from graffiti. But, you know, that now let's forget about all of this, let's talk about graffiti, otherwise you know a lot of people. No, no, the, actually I wanted, I just know that, no, just had a note to ask you the next question, sorry for interrupting, is actually to make to make it very clear what is graffiti and what is street art and your, and your understanding of these two terms, because this for me, I have my understanding, I have said it many times in interview and whenever everybody tell me, I say more or less the similar, for me street art comes from graffiti and one is before the other, but okay, people uh, use uh, graffiti and street art as a labels most of the time in their favor or regarding uh, financial profit. So people who sell out their souls and they say they're doing street art because it's more uh, sellable than graffiti, but okay. Anyway, long story short, I'm interested, what is, yeah, exactly, you will actually make it clear what is the... What is your opinion on graffiti and street art and how you distinguish them? Do you ex di distinguish, you make a difference or it's... Uh, so here is the idea. I mean, to some extent what you say, it's, it's the general... Uh, I mean, I, I, I generally agree. In the sense that there is a relationship with street art, you might say like, you know, a la Banksy, uh, you know, things, mm -hmm. you know, what you might call representational styles of uh, street art. So where you see things instead of, you know, rep things represented instead of lettering, of course, sh surely historically it came later. So what, but I think that what you're touching upon, it's, it's a crucial issue. Uh, people 
try to distinguish street art from graffiti because they want to, to some extent, uh, get the credit, street credit, you know, that kind of edgy mm -hmm. aspect of graffiti and bring it to a commercial setting, keep, you know, this idea of street art in order to make it, make it marketable. Uh, now, I have made one of my missions to rescue street art from <laughs> fake street artists and give it back to the real ones who are, you know, generally for me, not only, but, you know, mostly they are the writers. You know, it's, you mm -hmm. know I mean, now I'm going to name the people that I think they do these for real. Mm -hmm. I mean, and either you, um, you know, the, the Taps and Moses, Zelle uh, Asfarkuto, you know, that kind of people mm -hmm. are those that when you think about now they're going to be, you know, Frat 32, they're going to be all upset when I say this. But those are the real people who do real street art uh, in a sense that actually makes uh, reasonable to talk about a genre of that kind. Uh, so the idea is that the genre for me is characterized by particular use of public space. Now I'm going back why I got interested in, mm -hmm. in graffiti after writing about public art. Because of course, public art uses and transforms in important senses public space. You know, you put a monument and you transform a square in a place where people go and, you know, recognize themselves, their histories, uh, see the values of their communities embedded, you know, put it that way. What street art does, and I think what graffiti does, it's something very, uh, it's similar, but also uh, saliently distinguished in the sense that graffiti uh, uses in transgressive ways, in subversive ways, a space, mm, which put it very simply, turns upside down the ways in which we normally use public spaces. You can't express yourself in public spaces and what graffiti writers is expressing themselves in public spaces. You know, that's the kind of basic idea. So for me, when people get interested in Banksy, it's not Banksy because Banksy does something witty, because he could do it anywhere. It's because he's using space in transgressive ways, in subversive ways, exactly as graffiti writers were doing before. Uh, and in this sense, I mean, other people have said this, in this sense, I think that what's interesting about street art, it's what's interesting about graffiti. It's this kind of transgression of uses of public spaces in ways they are playful and creative, witty, ironic. And then, of course, you have, you know, this proliferation of styles, you know, lettering went to, in other directions, as you, you know, better than I do, people started doing what we call, you know, street uh, representation of street art where usually people were doing graffiti and then, you know, they just changed, you know, they had an evolution. If you think about what Taps and Moses do, of course, there are forms of evolution. Uh, my friend Pietro Rivasi did uh, this phenomenal exhibition on um, a generation, a regeneration of graffiti. Uh, what was it? Uh, the, the one in Modena? Yes, 1984. Yeah, uh, yeah. 1984, we actually, you know, showed partly of the, you know, the, um, the, the trajectory uh, of uh, the evolution of uh, graffiti in ways that, of course, are, I, I think they're indistinguishable with actual, real, authentic forms of street art. The problem that there is, you know, Giocofino calls it fake street art. There is a, a lot of fake street art that sucks, and it's out there, pretends to be something that it's not. And the problem is that it's still in the concept. Now, I'm a philosopher, and I think that when people steal your names, they steal everything. You I mean, maybe not everything, but a lot of what you are. If you steal my name, <laughs> that's a problem. <laughs> it's called, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. identity theft. I think yes. what they're, they're trying to do it's that. A way of normalizing, for instance, subversive practices is to relabel them, repackage them, and make them less threatening. That's what happened all the time. So it seems to me that's a way to normalize a practice that is showing the limits of our policies of, you know, spatial control. Now, I'm, pu I'm putting a lot of stuff into it, but that's why I got interested in graffiti and street art. My, ide my idea which is far from being my personal idea, it's what's mm -hmm. happening is that space has been uh, controlled in authoritarian ways 
at least since the beginning, you know, roughly it's the 1950s, you know, after the Second World War, you start to see regulations and laws that start to control in tight, very tight ways what you can do in public spaces. Now, I'll give you an example. I grew up in Massa, which is a, a city in north, northern Tuscany, by the beach. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm not super old, but I'm not either 15 years old. So, but, and so I have memories of when I was a kid. When I was a kid, you could go to the beach at night in these little shops, you know, little bars, sort of improvised situation. You get a little beer for cheap. You spend time with your friends, play the guitar. Others may have other activities that are more interesting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, there's... Take the, the guitar, but somebody has to be the loser. Yeah. <laughs> you know, imagine, yeah. imagine what I was doing. I, I wanted to be a guitar player in my life. You know, I used to be a musician uh, mm-hmm. before starting my PhD. And um, so it, it was actually very informal. Now you can't do that anymore because there are laws that prevent you from entering the beach after a certain time. Most beaches now, they are par- privately not owned because in Italy you can't own a beach, but you can actually yeah. administer the beach. And the point is that what has become is that even if they don't own it nominally, they actually they yeah. own it practically. So they, they, can, they own it, yeah. Yeah, who has access, who, who doesn't. And it's, you know, the same story over and over again. And the more we go, the more we see that kind of transformation. I mean, actually, I, have, mm-hmm. I had these, I mean, I always talk to my mom often, well, I've seen since we were in lockdown about these things, because, of course, she's always so concerned about the violation of the law. But if you see, you know, it's it, it now in Pisa, there are laws that would prevent you from putting uh, like bottles on a, on, on a public bench. So if you put mm-hmm. a bottle on a public bench, you could be fined of 100 euros. <laughs> I, I, I was, why? You can't sit on, on actually on stairs. Mm? There's a friend of mine used to be the, um, you know, one of the, to work for the, for the, um, for the mayor. And, you know, as a protest, he sit outside of a church and he got 100 euros fine for sitting in front of a church. If you lay on grass, you get fined. If you lay on a, on a, on a, on a bench, I mean, if you're, if you're a, you know, if you're a homeless and homelessness is a real thing. I mean, homeless people are not responsible for what they do. They're not bad people. If you don't have a house or you try to nap on, on, a, on a bench, like, who are you damaging? Now, these people get fined in Pisa, and some of them get actually kicked out of the, of, for, with the, what is called a dust bowl. They get kicked out of the, uh, basically, of the urban center. So that's yeah. how I got interested in graffiti. Yeah, but, okay, but this, what is the relation of these two graffiti? Because I think that graffiti is one way in which y- we, you can see how much controlled we are in our lives. Mm? And mm-hmm. it's at the same time a way to react against that, that particular kind of control. You know, to put it very simply, or to read it, in, you know, give a reading, when st- graffiti writing started, mm? what happened is that people didn't have access to expression in public spaces, started to have access to expression in public spaces. And this mm-hmm. is profoundly revolutionary. And in effect, you see the legislations that are actually approved against graffiti writing, they seem to be completely disproportionate compared to the kind of violation that you make. I mean, you are seriously painting something that, I mean, you're not killing anybody. We have hooligans. In yeah. Italy, we have hooligans every week. Mm, that during soccer with speaking speaking physical violence, not uh, graffiti hooligans. Mm? You mean uh, football ultras? No, no. Uh, I, I'm, I'm thinking about the hooligans that take, for instance, they take hostage every week in in Italy to cities, and not. They, but you know, there are not laws that are as severe as you can find against uh, graffiti writers, which of course they don't go around and beat the people, beat people. Uh, 
Okay, so let's move on. On the this was a long background into into the graffiti, and but but interesting, you know. So in how comes then that uh, I, from what I understand, sh- shortly is like your uh, your how you say practice of uh, urban transformation of urban space brought you to the point of graffiti, and then what happened? What happened then? How uh, now you are not a graffiti. Uh, Uh, did you paint graffiti at some point? No, I never did. Never. Okay, so you you were following graffiti, from what I understand, in a way. Maybe you were watching, uh, you're reading books or something like this. Or I f- see people like you, which is the best thing. And why, Which what is the best thing? The best thing is when I first encountered people, intelligent people, much more intelligent than me, that they went to school, not like me... Uh, no, not go to school until 10th grade but no look for me it's it's like it was shocking to see when i start to to sell products to to sell art and to meet people or to make something public i start to meet people and i discover people like you and i say oh okay actually there are people involved in this subculture or whatever you call it culture movement uh, style lifestyle blah 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 as you like call it as this way but then i discover okay they're lawyers they're intellectuals they are historians they are researchers they are academics in a big in the big uh, put it on a big uh, how you say under a big uh, roof to generalize and these people they don't practice graffiti but they're interested they're studying it they're researching it and they're helping this movement or uh, to, to they're trying maybe to understand it and they're passionate about it and i understood at this point again and again how important graffiti is and uh, this is why i I'm very interested in what you're saying and what what other people also are saying. And when I heard the speak with you and Enrico about the the copyright, which was the the other topic that I want to do, to dive in right now. And uh, yeah, this is this 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 is for me is amazing. I don't know if you understand it because you say yeah, I am not. Uh, I when I ask the questions, what is your relationship with graffiti? This doesn't mean why don't you paint to speak, you know, because some people actually, I have heard this as a comment, you know, people would say, hey, who is he to speak? He never uh, went out to paint. Hey, people don't have to go out to paint. They don't have to, not everybody have to be an active player on a game or an art movement to understand because it's not going to be the first, if you don't, yeah, sorry, some people maybe don't uh, agree to say art movement. So yeah, I said a lot of stuff, maybe you want to do a comment. <laughs> oh, I mean, like, uh, uh, No, I, I I mean I didn't I didn't take it as a, I didn't take it as a, as a criticism, but I, you know if you want to put it this way, uh, so graffiti is a social network, like all human practices. So there are different people related with you know throughout the practice, and everyone does a different thing. Now you can be, uh, for instance. Uh, a person who's a punk, even if you don't play the guitar, right? Or if, yeah. you, if you don't play an instrument, you can do any, all sorts of other things. You know, there are punk people who are interested in collecting, for instance, uh, uh, vinyls. Vinyls, yeah. yeah. Say. So are, are they lesser of punk than others? I don't think it's... The, the Yeah, they're just not musicians. They are part of the movement. But I mean, I think for graffiti, it's, it's a bit different because for graffiti, you have to be a writer to say, but yeah, you are part of, you are not writer, but you are part of the movement. Yeah. I would say the social network that relates to yeah. the practice. Actually, so this yeah. means that I am very careful in saying, I don't want to say, I don't want to take the credit of uh, speaking from a position of a person who is involved directly in, for instance, painting something. Uh, but of course, you know, there are many other things, you know, there are, you know, aspects of curation. And I think that I give my contribution by trying to uh, illuminate some of the theoretical issues mm, that can have practical, con- you know, consequences that may actually lead writers to make choices that actually are contrary to what they are, their intentions, because, you know, the word is complicated and it's not that I have the pretense of understanding better than anyone else. Uh, But what I try to do is like, listen, for instance, with copyright, it's like, listen, what you're trying to do is going to lead you there. You want to go there? And that's, you know, the general, uh, you know, the the general, um, 
point about the copyright, and I see, and I think what I, how I see my my role uh, in this uh, dialogue and exchange, and of course there is a sense in which I have I, I am existentially very close to people that are writers, in the sense that uh, for one reason or another, we usually share a, a particular kind of sensibility. In the sense, for me, when I hear a graffiti writer, I hear a person who has intuitions and ways of thinking about reality that usually are very similar to mine. That's why I usually, I, I didn't just get, I sh certainly got interested for intellectual reasons, but then there was a very deep uh, existential mm, connection because I think that the ways in which writers live their lives are in some important senses more authentic than the ways in which many other people live their lives. I mean, I don't know, in my book starts with the, with the quote from Fuel, uh, who says uh, something like, uh, um, uh, graf graffiti is showing that somebody is, has, no, is, is, has overcome the fear of people telling you how you should live your life. And you think, it, you know, now you might not have a sense, but this is, a connection that I don't know if a few have made it consciously, but to so much literature on resist political resistance. So the point that is making it's something that, for instance, Foucault makes, Bakhtin makes, people talking about carnival strategies of resistance make. The idea is that people control you not because they beat you on the street, but because they make you so fearful that you don't even raise your hand, you don't even raise your voice. Yeah. So control, social control is not based on active policy. It's based on the fact that people make you fearful of doing anything so that they yeah. don't even have to punish you, that you are punishing yourself. And the idea is, you know, what I find very interesting in graffiti writers is that they don't accept to live their lives following their fears. Now, you might agree or disagree with the person who paints a train. But that's a completely different question. The, qu the question that interests me and the question that I think people interested in graffiti are raising hmm, is the question about how we should live our lives. I mean, the, you know, you, uh, now Pietro is going to be very happy when I say freedom is not defined by safety. But I think that there is a, a true depth in saying that, because again, we are terrified about everything in our lives. And that makes us the, you know, the most dociles of servants. We can have the you can have whatever you want, but if you don't ask, you live as you are told. You go to work, you take a train, you can't leave a mark, you go home, you buy your beer, but not outside, and you stay inside. And this to me... Until you can... Until you can buy beer. <laughs> until you can, until well, that's a bit, I mean <laughs> Enjoy that we still let you buy in beer, bro. You know, it, it sounds crazy when I see these things. Uh, you know, the these uh, decorum laws in Pisa were also about consuming and buying alcohol from I think from six PM. Um, Is this quarantine related or it's just the law right now? Uh, so the law, I think, was actually was actually expired. It was firstly approved, uh, if I remember correctly, in October two thousand and seventeen. But I might actually got my dates wrong. There is, I it's going to be a, an article published on this. But it's very okay. famous. Everybody can look it up. It's uh, crazy. okay, mm -hmm. crazy. No, just but anyway, this is this is not surprising me. Uh, it's just not the first place. It's not the first time you hear it. You see it everywhere, and now. I'm expecting a lot of new laws and new restrictions uh, thank that will be just uh, slipped in thanks to the lockdown because we are going to be locked for probably a few more days more then slowly resume the normal life, normal life. And I think there will be some surprises, but okay, let's be optimistic. Andrea... Just before we dive actually in the copyright, uh, I wanted to ask you to, to one thing. You are author on few books. 
Uh, one of one of which is with uh, Pietro Rivasi. Would you tell me a bit about a, bi- a bit about these projects separately one by one, and then we can speak about copyright. So the first uh, book you talked about was actually unauthorized and commissioned. It's spelled with all sorts of strange signs. Uh, only Pietro knows exactly how it's spelled. The title. Uh, that was, you know, one of the, you know, most beautiful moments, uh, perhaps, in my career. So I actually met Pietro mm-hmm. in uh, four years ago. It was just our anniversary on Facebook. That's why I know it. Uh, okay. on, a, on a Skype interview, because that's the, at the time it was actually working on 1984. I was writing as usual. And, you know, my idea was like you, to get to know the people I was interested in to just to, you know, not to tell them what they were doing, but just try to understand what they were doing. And I remember I called him on Skype and I was in Huashan, which is uh, the yellow mountain in China. And he was in Mm -hmm. Mali. We started talking and it was supposed to be, I think 30 minutes. And then it turned out to be two hours discussion. Um, And then, you know, our, but I mean, again, it's, it's interesting because it's a friendship based on a shared, interest and shared sensibilities not because we were just sitting right next to the other in class yeah. and uh we t- did you sit in a in a class together or this was just a, ah, okay ah, okay it's so interesting because most of the people that i met and some of them are italian i met them in mm-hmm. china i never okay met them or when i was in china and they were here virtually so we talked to Pietro, I talked to Pietro, and Pietro got interested in, uh, in my views. And he was, uh, he had the project 1984, and that there was this, you know, something happened because Pietro has a very specific way of working on graffiti exhibitions. Uh, yeah. And so people went there were actual you know, hardcore writers. And of course, when you bring hardcore writers, you bring people, then then they will tag the city. You work within the city, not just in the gallery. So there was this other side of the the exhibition that was the outside of the exhibition. What happened when the artists came? And Pietro wanted to reflect and think about that. um, And he knew that I was actually working on... uh, let's say, ways of understanding how you can bring graffiti or street art in institutional context. And so Mm -hmm. he wanted to, you know, just give me a chance to write about uh, what was happening. So he asked me if I wanted to do it. I was super happy, very super, like a kid, super happy. And then, you know, we went back and forth and the Zellers for Culture, of course, read it. You know, we circulated the manuscript to as many people as uh, we could. Of course, I, again, my views are uncanny in, in the sense that uh, they're not mainstream in any context. So, you know, there was uh, some resistance, but I think <laughs> <laughs> that's what I, have, that what I have to say is, uh, you know, it's, it's, at least it's valuable. Um, it gives, I mean, my, my concern is to give tools to people to think through the practice about their lives, what it means to be creative, what it means to live public space through public space. The other book, it's, it's a philosophy guide to street art and the law. Mm-hmm. So there was, again, another commission. Uh, I'm, I'm super lucky because actually, you know, most things that I do, I, I'm asked to do. Um, uh, so they asked me if I wanted to write something on the relationship between street art and the law. I wrote something a little earlier, like another article in there. I was super happy again because I thought that there was a, such a rich um, topic there to explore. Of course, mm-hmm. issue, you know, legality, legality, what's the, you know, relationship? Is that an essential relationship? Like, you know, is it necessary, sufficient? Uh, questions of this kind. And of course, the question of copyright was, at the time when I started to work on that book, it was actually on the rise. You know, it, it's been a, an issue for a long time, but you know, there was five points and all sorts of things mm-hmm. coming up when I was uh, working on the on, on that project. And uh, that was, you know, work that I am very proud, not because of the, um, of what I say, but it's because it, how it's developed. 
it's a, co- a guide because I'm interested in helping people understand. So it's, you know, to somebody who has a very simple structure, it addresses questions clearly formulated, and I answer my questions with yes or no. Or yes, but there, you know, there is a sense in which one of the things I think it's complicated when and I use complicated, when you get to uh, academics, is they, they always uh, refuse to give an answer. They ask, is, is street art illegal? It's always like, well, you know, it's complicated. Things are all complicated, right? It's how we live our lives. And so the point is that what people expect is that you tell them something. And maybe you're wrong. And maybe, you know, they will tell yes. you, no, that's not the point. Uh, but I am... I go full throttle when I go. In the sense, I will okay. tell you, I think that's the case. And then if you don't, if for these and these and these other reasons, of course, it's going to be a way of simplifying reality, but that's what we do. Otherwise, you know, we just live. Hmm? It's like, yeah. you know, physics doesn't consider all the exceptions to the laws of physics. It gives you a, a system to handle reality in ways that then are actually useful in engineering and blah, blah, blah. What I try to do is that these series of tools that can allow people to clarify, help them navigate their lives as street, you know, for instance, as graffiti writers, if you're a lawyer, if you are a judge, if you're a politician, if you're an academic like me, or even if you're just, uh, you know, a person who enjoys to look at graffiti. So that's, you know, those are my two biggest projects uh, related mm-hmm. to you know, longest at least the two. So, oh, then there are you know many other things that I wrote. And no, I'm spe- yeah, I was asking specifically for the for the graffiti street art related project. They both of these books they are available. They are uh, possible people to find them, or they're already gone. And uh... Uh, so uh, the the book with uh, um, Pietro, which is unauthorized on commission, I think it actually went, yeah. uh, uh, it was uh, published by Whole Train Press. Yes. It, it, there was also an artistic version. I think that it's, uh, you can't find it from the press anymore. <laughs> but if they, okay. you know, if they get enough uh, requests. The other one is published by Brill. Uh, it's insanely expensive. Uh, okay, it's academic book. Okay, so jumping into the deep water, uh, just to, I think I already explained it, but I will make an introduction again. Copyright, talking about copywriting graffiti, graffiti writers who are claiming copyrights on illegal artworks and graffiti writers who are being victim of corporations and later on taking cases. So tell me, uh, what is your opinion on copyright? So, you know, the, 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 the short story is that I am a copyright skeptic in the sense that I think that opting for copyright or at least looking for copyright protection is uh, a mistake. It's not the right thing to do. And it's actually what will might accelerate the death of graffiti. So, to put it very shortly, copyright, bad. <laughs> okay, why? Why? You, you said it's going to accelerate the death of graffiti, and why opting in for copyright is wrong? So here is the idea. Yeah, sure. So here is the idea. Um, now, uh, there are two, uh, let's, see, let's say, let's distinguish first two questions. One is how... Uh, current legislation will deal with uh, the copyright copyright claims of graffiti writers. Now, this is a question that it's mostly for people like uh, Enrico, mm? so they mm-hmm. are legal scholars. So you look at what the laws are, and then you try to understand how they work. The other question is whether or not apl- you know extending copyright protection to street art is the right thing to do, which is a moral question, what I call at least. The moral question, Mm -hmm. is that the right thing to do? The answer, I think it's no. Why it's no? And it's related to, you know, the idea of the death of graffiti. Now, the answer relies, of course, on my understanding of graffiti. Now, we talked for more than, you know, for an hour about how I think, what I think about graffiti. And for me, the, the use 
the graffiti writers do of public space is subversive. It's subversive for many reasons. One of the reasons hmm, that we actually listed, if not the primary reason, is because they use public space freely in two senses. That is, without um, limitation, and the other one for free. That is, without paying royalties. Hmm? In this sense, I think that graffiti is a gift to the city. The writer makes, gives a gift to the city. Now, this is mm -hmm. very puzzling for most of us. No, I'm sure that you're a writer and people will ask you, but do you do it for money? And when they actually know, learn that you actually even pay for the paint, they are very surprised. About why would you want to do something like that? Because we reach you guys getting paid. <laughs> we reach a point in our societies where whatever you do, if you cannot monetize, it's not just bad, it's stupid, and you shouldn't do it. Now, this logic, it's a logic that actually contradicts, again, everything we do normally. Mm, I do something for money, you know, everything becomes in form of economic exchange and trade. Now, how do we make art something that you can trade? The answer is very simple. It's through copyright. You make it an object, something that it's much more than that, but roughly you make it something that, you know, that is a specified, is a tangible form, where there are very specific limitations of what you can do. You can trade it in, in very specific ways. Now, what I think it happens when you get into copyright is that you're transforming a practice that is ephemeral, is based on, you know, in, in improvising in the public space, is based about gift giving, uh, you know, interacting with others, sharing into a practice that is based on objects, objects that you trade, objects that are owned. Now, the question is, Taps and Moses, who owns their tag? It's phenomenal because, you know, they go through this project with a thousand, you know, trains, then materializing the connection between the writer and, uh, and, uh, and the tag. Uh, showing what? Something that I think it's in the practice, which is the sharing aspect of, uh, aspect of it. When you go into copyright, that's what you're going to lose. It's go you're going to lose the sharing aspect. Mm -hmm. uh, you're going to lose the focus on the practice, that is on what people do, rather than in what they have done, that is the product. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, in turn, will transform graffiti in a money-making practice. Now, there are, of course, already at play these transformations. It's not that I come in, in Italian, we say from the soapy mountain. <laughs> when you are, what does it mean? When uh -huh. you are naive, they say you come from the soapy mountain. Uh, uh -huh, no. It's not that I'm naive. There are these things, but there are, of course, people are trying to resist this. And I think that the most interesting, one of the most interesting aspects of the practice that is, is, has been born and developed in these ways. Uh, the writer's bench, the sharing aspect, uh, the fact that whatever you were doing was with others, sometimes even against others, but it was always a, some kind of social relationship in ways in which mm -hmm. when you start to look at these things, because that's what they become, they become things in terms of copyright, then you're giving them you know, an existence that transform that what you do. And you just you lose that, I think, marvelous aspect of creativity that has to do with um, graffiti. Now, when we were talking with uh, um, Enrico in Lisbon, when you mentioned, the mm -hmm. question, one of the key questions was when you think about graffiti in terms of copyright is, who made it? Now, to me, this is the greatest distortion that you can introduce in the practice for the following reason. It's the wrong kind of question. It's not who made it, but how it works. Now, imagine the, you know, exchanging signatures, you know, whatever happens, giving, you know, suggestions to people. Is it really 
so central to know whether Taps and Moses did this or that, or Uther either did this or that. Or it, what's interesting is to understand how these practice, how these intervention in public spaces function. So the question that is central to copyright, who owns it, who made it, are all wrong questions. They are questions that are imposed on a, on a practice that never had that concern. And developed in these, you know, ways that mirror other practices, artistic practices outside of the mainstream, at least after the Renaissance, mm -hmm. uh, in Western art. Now, I have this, you know, I've, you know, I'm an, I'm an academic, so I have an academic training. The, you know, this concern was actually raised to me the first time in my class about, you know, one of the classes in Italian Renaissance art. It's the idea of the workshop. Nobody knows what Botticelli painted. Nobody. Yeah. And I remember my wonderful professor, Marcia Hall, at some point said, well, you know, it might be very difficult to understand where, you know, which part he made. And he said, but, it, and she said this beautiful thing, which is what I said. Uh, but I think that ask who made it is the wrong kind of question because that was never the point of what they were doing. They were trying to, you know, create things that work, function and work in certain ways. And what interests us is how these things function in public space. It's not who made them. And uh, that's, you know, one of the transformation. And when you start to ask those questions, then you naturally go to monetize things. You monetize things. Now, Enrico, for instance, believes that because of what they're called the copy norms, that is the social norms that regulate how graffiti writers think about their production in spite of the laws, no major litigations will follow from the application of copyright to you know, graffiti, especially legal graffiti. Example? So the idea is that um, you made a piece on... Mm -hmm. uh, on a wall. On a wall. Mm, like yeah. you did the methods <laughs> lately. Uh, mm -hmm. in, uh, I didn't, I, whatever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, somebody makes some pieces, yeah. stuff, which is illegal. Now, uh, you cross it over. Mm? Can that mm -hmm. person, you know, the person that originally made the piece, mm, sue you? Or can it, that person sue you because you are stealing a particular? feature of that person's style. Yeah, wait, th these are two different uh, sub subjects, but I think today, today now uh, it will come to the point that actually writers, instead of keeping it street and keeping it gra graffiti, they will probably go to sue each other for crossing because at the point when somebody can prove a copyright on a piece, then the next comer who will come to take over the, the, the place it can be sued. And I think, I'm not sure if it's already existing, but for Muro, speak, uh, people have been arrested painting over graffiti or over Muro, and the Muro has been commissioned, and uh, of course the court and the penalty leads to a decision that the graffiti, even though that is graffiti above street art, but it's a commercial uh, paid Muro. So, uh, yes it became uh, copyright, it became evident in the situation. And uh, yes, for sure, also the resemblance of style, I think there are people already talking about it and trying to implement and to say, yeah, you are plagiating. There was a case from people I know, there was a p official letter sent by a lawyer who sent to the artist, say, hey, you are... Uh, copying the idea of my customer who created this artwork so they try to implement this and uh, it's a big subject but uh, yeah look this is the same with music you know hip hop created with sampling and today you cannot sample anything basically so this kills the creativity but this is why you know there's so many for me this this subject i i don't i have my own opinion but my own opinion is not concrete on the on the red or on the black you know or on the on the on the on the side because what about the writers who let's say revoke for example he had uh, this case with h&m you know about it yeah uh it's uh, 
actually, it, be it begins the article in uh, in uh, in uh, Enrico's edited collection. Uh -huh. <laughs> the okay. Revox case. In, in January 2018, Jason Revox Williams' lawyer sent to H and M the Swedish Growing Company. Yeah, and for example, he's he's a writer who who came from the streets or who was painting on the streets. And uh, he became, in a way, a victim because the company uses his artwork. And at, at this point, okay, let's say that he don't don't care about the money. You know, maybe he don't do it about the money. Maybe he had the other the the other opinion that is, hey, I don't want my thing associated with you. Imagine tomorrow, Kukuk Clan take uh, take a full, a full group photo in front of his artwork. You know, like this, and, and it's like the official poster of Ku Klux Klan, your artwork is behind, what the fuck do you do? You say, hey, hey, I want to distance from this. Hey, guys, what the fuck, you know? And it's a good idea to ruin somebody's career, though. But... <laughs> <laughs> you had a great idea, now you're gonna do it. <laughs> I know, but I don't, I don't have enemies. This is the thing. It's just if somebody wants to take it. But yeah, what do you think about this? Oh, sure. I mean, at, in, in my work, I actually address this concern. Uh, in the sense, one, once again, I don't come from the soapy mountain in the sense I know that there are these issues. Uh, and now here, you know, just to clarify my relationship, uh, you know, the relationship between my view and Enrico. On the concern, we agree. We disagree okay. with the solution. In the sense okay. that... Uh, um, Enrico thinks that copyright is a tool for subversion in the sense that it can keep, in, in, uh, using copyright can allow people like Revok and so forth and so on to uh, prevent corporation from exploiting what they do. Mm -hmm. So corporate appropriation. I mean, as far as I, as everybody is, would be listening to this, they know that I am not a fan. I hate, like, actually... Uh, that our life is regulated in terms of profit, just the profit. I mean, money are important, but everything has to revolve around profit. It's a huge problem. And of course, I have no, not the slightest sympathy for a corporation that appropriates the design of a graffiti writer. And I think that's wrong, and that should be prevented. Now, what I think is that the strategy that Enrico proposes might actually function, let's say, practically, because now that's the only thing we have. So mm -hmm. if you want to protect right now what, uh, you know, your work from H&M, perhaps, no, you go to Enrico and probably uh, filing for a copyright case, it's your, yeah. your option. But that, but what I say is different, is that that is a move that might work a little bit, but actually risk to throw the water, you know, the dirty water with the kid. So what I'm actually proposing, it's something reformative from a legislative point of view. So what I would like to see, rather than seeing Revok going to his lawyers to fight against H&M, I would like to see him, and I mean, I love Revok, I mean, I, I, it sounds that I actually don't like him. Maybe he's going to listen to me. No, no, no. Number no, one. Uh, what I would like him to do with other people like Shepard Ferry, everybody who has a, you know, a shred of public not notoriety, you know, that everybody that can make actually a dent in the media is to say, listen, we need new laws. We need a different system of copyright to protect what we do. Because the idea that the only way that you can protect a work from commercial appropriation is copyright is just not true. Of course, you know, it's just to accept that the status quo is the only possible way in which we can live. And I am super skeptical about that. We have other legislations, creative commons. Now, they might not be perfect, but creative commons provide people with uh, what basically licenses they are sharing licenses. So some of the things that you are mentioning will not, you know, like you sue somebody else for crossing might be actually not possible by law, but they will allow you to protect uh, the work from commercial appropriation. So you don't get a commercial license 
I actually spoke to, uh, what's her name? Um, actually, she's the lawyer who drafted the, 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 the creative comments. So, the, you know, one way is that you say everything that it's done in a certain way, let's say we, we develop a, a, a creative common um, license for graffiti. Yeah. Now, yeah. of course, this has all sorts of complications, but it's just, again, it's just an idea. The other one is what call, it's called cultural rights. Cultural rights are actually established by the UNESCO to protect traditional, you know, usually forms of expression of traditional cultures that fail mm -hmm. to fulfill the requirements of copyright. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is applicable. Is this applicable to graffiti and street art? It will be, yes. Of course, you know, it's legally, it's not easy. And I'm not trying to say that it's easy. Yeah, of course. But, but of course, if you never start, you never get there. So what I would like to see, it's, for instance, a system of, uh, let's say, rights that leave street art and graffiti in the public domain with the impossibility for corporations to actually sue. I give an example that actually... Enrico also discusses, in, uh, I think in the UK, there are laws about the protection of works that are anonymous. So we have already laws that allow people mm -hmm. to prevent commercial exploitation from works that you don't know who the author is. Usually then, you know, the, basically people who decide whether you can do that or not is a commission that is selected. Now, there might be many ways in which you can organize that, envision that. In the graffiti and street art communities, and that's the kind of uh, discussion that I would like to see. Is now we find a way to protect what we do from commercial exploitation, which is the evil, without actually becoming one of them. Because that's the yeah. point. Because once you have transformed <laughs> yourself into a person, into an owner into a producer, then of course you're responding to the same logic that they are operating within. And it's not because we are yeah. good or bad. It's because once you enter the pool, you got, you're got you gonna get wet. And there is no way. Yeah. But you start to think about what you do in terms of an object with determinate properties, that it's owned by a certain person, that you cannot think about it in a different way. And that's what I'm trying to Then you don't do graffiti at all. And that's my point. I th and that's exactly my point. Is the idea is that once you start to look at what you do in those terms, then you have killed the practice. And that's the idea of graffiti. Yeah, but the, the, the nature of graffiti, there are no nature. The nature that I understand, because I cannot speak for others, because maybe the artists that are victims of or have been involved in something like this, they think different way. And everybody can think about different way because still graffiti is freedom. It's not has been legitimized. It, there is no the code of graffiti printed. Even if it's printed, who the fuck gave the right to person to print it? And uh, the whole idea of graffiti for me, it's that it's uninstitutionalized and it's not coded except the unwritten code of graffiti, but this varies in my brain, in my understandings and my hood and my my country and this this is different in it's this is this is the thing and nobody feel a form online and saying hey guys I'm going to paint five by four on uh, 732 Boulevard Ave Maria no you're not doing this with the idea and to then to have it no the 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 prime idea of going and doing and painting and if I'm let's say I'm a victim I'm on the place of revoke or five points or whoever get a victim and literally you become a victim or you became a part of a case because you can also see yourself as not as a victim you know if I see myself printed on a big advertising I might say thank you guys you know because I have different vision on the world and I have different perspective of my art because I go out, I create something for the people to say something and not only that I do it with intentions for the public and uh, for people to enjoy it, I even spread it myself. So I'm like, boom, look, this is it. And when somebody take it, 
and and show it more i say thank you you are helping my message to reach more people but at the moment if somebody take a picture and say clack buy this new artwork by boris it's very nice 100 euro and i get not nothing then it's like hey bro chill what the fuck then it's like okay maybe i should call enrico now and ask him hey bro what we do now with this they are doing a hundred euros of of stuff you know sure and i'm not suggesting but, you come to me if you want to actually <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I will come to you and you will give me the number of enrico or somebody else that you know you know the, in the network the network is small you can directly find the sources to 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 reach for legal help but i mean the the thing is from what i also told you is like i don't do it with the intentions of getting copyrights because this is completely against the idea and but i'm do at the moment when i will be a victim i'll be like nah. so my personal understanding yeah no absolutely yeah. but i i think you know once again um i think even me you and enrico we all agree in the sense that of course once you start to profit from other people's work that's a problem i mean it seems obvious to me that it's wrong it's unmoral yeah by all means so what this does mean this means basically if you're, if you're a piece of shit like everything else in life when you're a piece of shit you're a piece of shit so then it will be nice people to have a tool I agree that there is there should be a tool and a way and a way people to save their 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 losses because sure. you know to how many things you know I don't know people if they think creatively or viciously if they think because today I don't like for example one uh, Ratznich writer from America and I say hey you know what I'm going to copyright your name I'm going to create a brand I'm going to buy the website I'm going to make a patent on this name and then you cannot produce any more artworks with this name I own you. This is a way you can fuck somebody, you know? And it's what he will do. He's painting this name 20, 30, 15, 3 years, I don't know, whatever. What he's going to do if there is no copyright, he's fucked. I think you're right. I mean, one other e crucial issue that I raise in my writings is that what it's even more general than about the point of graffiti in street art. It's like, is copyright actually helping creativity? Now, let me put it very clearly. Every reasonable form of defense of copyright, in some senses, has to justify the fact that you limit circulation of knowledge. Now, yeah. the, the basic point yeah. is that the more you circulate knowledge, the more you promote creativity, the more you actually produce good outcomes. They are good for society. Now, I'm going to tell you something, so we link it to the present time, uh, the vaccine and the drugs for against the COVID. Now, copyright, so a better patents because it's not copyright, it makes a sense insofar as, hmm, so you protecting the, the, you know, the intellectual property of drugs and vaccines, insofar actually the idea is that it promotes research. So I get a reward because I have a patent on a medicine. So I'm actually encouraged to work harder in order to make money. But that actually don't, doesn't always work that way. Now, for instance, there are, you know, we wrote actually together with Enrico, and on these we agree, mm -hmm. on compulsory licenses about, for instance, the remdesivir which is this drug that supposedly helps fighting uh, the, inf the infection of coronavirus. Now, remdesivir is owned, the patent is owned by a company in, uh, in, in California. If they tell you that they don't give you the drug, you don't get it. Now, there are, you know, the World Health Organization has produced this, they are called compulsory licenses, whereby you can force them to give it to you for very special reasons. Now, on these, we agree with, with De Rico because he thinks that protecting intellectual property when people are dying makes no sense. You have to make the drug circulate, the knowledge circulate, because it will actually bring benefit to the whole of the society. Now, in the case- It will save lives. Yeah, it makes us- yeah. you know, now, on this, we agree. He thinks is a special case. I think that 
it's not a special case. I think it's, a, it's the symptom of the fact that the IP protection is upside down. The fact that you have in a pandemic to use a special legal tool for asking for the license of a medicine that will save hundreds of million, if not billion people, it seems to be upside down. And this is my intuition Then others might disagree. But copyright is the same thing. Circulating art, circulating styles, circulating knowledge is what enhances creativity. You mentioned hip hop before. It's not a case that all the most interesting artistic kinds and genres, whether you like them or not, in the 20th century came out of a violation and a fight or outside of copyright, performance art, conceptual art. You might not like it. I think that most of it is bullshit, but that's the case. Conceptual art, performance art, graffiti, street art, hip hop, they were all constitutively Arts that violated copyright. Yeah. If you if you try to do what they were doing in New York City with you know rap and hip hop, now you go to jail. There are these phenomenally interesting interviews of people, you know, when they started to actually file against you know cases of copyright protection against rap, uh, you know, musicians. Yeah. When you see these, you know, the, you know, the, the rappers and, you know, people doing hip hop, they were just like, but that's me. It's not them. I just sampled it. And then it's me. Everybody knows it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but okay, look, they just, they just saw a way to make money. You know, this is the, this is the other Im immoral part, you know, because the idea of having the two is to have mm, something to protect you, but not to abuse with it because okay everybody knows you know in USA the lawsuits are just like poof 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 okay he look on the left the lawsuit he speak on the right the lawsuit you know this is this is the other thing and yeah it's well I mean it's like now I don't want to draw a, a, an analogy that is inflammatory but I'm a little polemical so I'm going to do it it's like when you have a gun you're going to use it That's what are, they are meant for. That's why in countries where they have lots of guns, then they have a lot of people dying from guns. Because yeah. that's what, you know, that, th those are the kind of possibilities that are opened up to you. Now, if you have the possibility of taking someone to court for copyright infringement, after, at some point, you'll do it. You be, maybe because you're poor. Maybe because uh, somebody hit you that day. Because maybe you had a fight with your wife. <laughs> Yeah, somebody gave you the idea for something that you didn't know that it exists after. As yeah, well. and you think, oh, maybe I can make a buck out of uh, out of that. Why not? Because again, I think that making money is in people's rights. So if it's in your right, then of course, why not? But I think it has a very, very, very deep cost. Our word is not a creative word. It's a word where creativity is yeah. suppressed constantly. I'll give you another example. Have you, you know, very recent. Did you see the Balcony singing in Spain, in Italy? Yes. Now, Balcony singing actually violates copyright. So, if you go outside... Yeah, not if, <laughs> <laughs> what, what you mean, like in YouTube or, or what? No, no, no. You go outside and you're Balcony singing and you, you know... Yeah, yeah, capisce. But, but the, the, the thing is, what, who is claiming those copyrights? Well, if you, you sing the so if you sing the song of I don't know of Iron Maiden or you know just to <laughs> amuse you, <laughs> amuse your neighbors, <laughs> <laughs> totally my neighbors <laughs> with the Iron Maiden. <laughs> <laughs> nice, but I'm gonna sing him, bro. <laughs> Iron, Iron Maiden could actually sue you. I mean, in, there is a, a discussion. You know, Spain was thinking so nice about so special. <laughs> was thinking about special copyright licensing for balcony singing. I mean... Come on, Reman. What the fuck, man? Come on. Chill. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I, I, again, it's not a surprise, you know, but uh, it's not a surprise, but it's a surprise. Like, like for real now, balcony singing. Uh, it, it's, it sounds like a fucking South Park episode. You're in the shower, like... Tu -tu 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 and then... It's the police! You sing O Sole Mio! <laughs> now you're coming with us! <laughs> I already know what's gonna happen. You know, if you tell this to... To a request that you know nobody's gonna enforce you, nobody's gonna enforce that right because of course copyright claims 
require the owner of the copyright to take you to court. As long as the copyright claim doesn't become automatic because there will be application in your phone that will listen how you sing and recognize the song and file automatic <laughs> and boom, it's gone. <laughs> But again, like this is something I was telling before. It's how you put fear in people. Now I'm going to tell you something yeah. that I don't know how many, yeah, of the, how many of the listeners will know. Now we are academics. And so we write things that nobody reads and we get no money out of those things. Now I have a very good friend of mine who works in Beijing. He's Italian too. His name is Matteo Ravasio. He specializes in philosophy of music. He wrote something that actually had, and he chose, in an article that maybe six people in the world will, will read, maybe 10, let's say 100 because I like it. Uh, okay. He wanted to use a line from a song of, I don't remember which artist, but a very famous artist. And I told him, listen, they are not going to let you do it. And he said, why? Because you're infringing copyright. And he said, it's not true. Man. As usual, what happened He called me and he said, you know what? They, the press asked me to remove that. Why? The, of course, it's the fear that the label yes, the fear. That yeah. will take Rousseau. them to court. Maybe it's not going to happen. But the point is that, yeah. for instance... That's the option. Yeah, 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 yeah. Music labels, they have offices filled with lawyers. That at some point, yeah. they have something to do. So if they think yeah. that they, you, they have merit, they'll take you. And here is another point. Do you know what's the average of a cost of a copyright claim not settled out of court? So before going to court in the U.S.? The price? No, I have no idea. $50,000, $60,000 to actually settle before you go to court, uh, if I remember correctly. If you go to court, okay. it's $250,000. Now tell me how the costs of a copyright lawsuit Will, you know, will protect a kid of 16 year, a 16 year old kid that goes at night and, and paints on a train. Now, it's not a case that all the legal disputes you're hearing are from people who have, and for good reasons, a lot of money. I mean, Revoc. It's not, you know, it's not nobody. It's a person who can afford. And I mean, I'm not, I'm not blaming him. You no, know, this is very important. It's not, I don't think that people have money are bad people. No. It's, I, I think it's, it's absolutely fine. It's, it's a brilliant artist. I love his stuff. And whatever he did, it deserves every single penny. But the point is that if you think that a system that requires you to be affluent in order to enforce your rights is a just system, then you have lost me. Because I think that justice yeah. systems are those who protect the ones that have nothing. It's not because... Man, well, welcome to reality, of course. The, no, but the, poor, the poor man eats his own shit. This is, uh, this is the rule and the, the reality, you know? Like the, everything else is a dream. Everything else we have to work and fight for, for accomplishing and, and, and exactly. granting it to again, the people. I don't come from the soapy mountain. I, don't, I know that, you know, the yeah, status quo is... Unfair, but look, uh, just just to tell you, you know, because your opinion is, in general, copyright no, with with few with few words, copyright no. I would say something else. You know, I already said that for me there must be a tool, and I understand the specific occasions for sure. There has to be a way to find uh, uh, copyright that is done on the right way. For sure, I don't know the way because also I don't care. Uh, I don't know who said it, but he said copyright is for losers. I personally believe in that. I hope one day I will not be a victim of a copyright infragmation. But morally, I, when I wake up in the morning, I get up of my bed and I say what I have to do today, what I have to create in order to bring uh, food on the table. And I don't expect and I don't... I dislike people who wake up in the morning and say, let me see who have to bring food on my table. And this is the mindset that actually poisons a lot of people, I think, on my opinion, is just 
if you take care of your actions and transform your energy on creating instead of searching in your back if somebody is using what you have already done look take it as a compliment why not somebody is using your work this means he admires your work he finds it interesting inter clever or maybe just by a reason is there for sampling it in audio or in video or in a meme or in a, in a in a graffiti this is a compliment and go further and i accept if somebody is doing money with things i have done with my ideas, uh, something that I came up, but he developed it more or he used this, my quotation or something. I, I, I find this, uh, it's more, uh, more better for myself is that to say, okay, he actually was clever than me. He was, he had a better opportunity than me, maybe uh, more uh, the, 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 the bigger budget to create something on a larger scale because we are speaking, if you're speaking for a larger corporation, then I would say, yes, I didn't have the opportunity. I'll never have the opportunity to create 1 million canvases that were sold, for example. They did it. And that's it, you know, I lose. But uh, what, I, what I lose is eventually the benefit that I don't get. But what I win is to see that actually I was able, with the work I'm putting it, to create this capacity. I just didn't find a way because, look, at the end of the day, if you want to do something, if you want to do a print, if you want to do a commercial work, you can do it. You can find the money. If you don't have it, you have all the tools. They are loan sharks. They are uh, public gathering of money. They, you can do a robbery. You can do how many things to get money to, to do something. But you didn't have the idea. Somebody else came with the idea and created it and you want to get money of it. Eh, this is a no-no. No, so there are, there are a couple of things in what you say. So I think that, for instance, it, what Eriko would say is that the point is that if you don't want to enforce your copyright, it, you can't not. Yeah. So that's how he's, why he says that it's so that copyright is flexible enough to allow for these changes. But again, you are, you are a very particular kind of um, figure and you grew up in a particular kind of world where copyright was for losers. So on the other hand, so what, what I'm trying to say is that uh, um, things, if we don't actively engage with transformations, things transform themselves in ways they are outside of our control at all. So maybe what's going to happen, you're not going to change, but maybe other people are going to change. Maybe they are going to take you to court. Yes. And I think you don't want that. Uh, no. And for instance, one of the things that you say, it's absolutely one of my points, which is the emphasis on production rather than rights. So what you do is material, it has some, you know, relationship with others. When people work, you usually get money. The idea of copyright in some senses is to profit from things that you already did. Now, copyright yeah. in music starts in the UK, when Bach, the, one of the sons of the more famous one, maybe it was a, actually was a uh, grandchild, was uh, one of the Bach, realized that people were making money by making adaptations of these works. Uh, for instance, for you know playing at home or doing other things. Mm -hmm. And he thought that was wrong. But you know, once you think about it, it's like you know you made it. You're making money. These people are putting a little bit of work. They're, you know, they are creating more about, you know, more culture, more art, more things that people can enjoy. Now, of course, I don't want to say that there are, there should be no limits. But what I'm trying to point out is that don't think that putting limits to creativity through copyright actually protects what people, you know, like protects creativity in itself because usually it does exactly the opposite now i have these other kinds which is phenomenal it's uh, it, it was a conversation i had with lino tagliapietra lino tagliapietra is perhaps the greatest uh, uh glass master from murano in the history of glass masters i think is the youngest person who became a glass master in the history of murano Record the history. So we, they go back hundreds of years. Now, when he came to China to show his stuff, he allowed people to take pictures. 
which never happens, in, especially in exhibitions in China, because people are terrified. The people take pictures and then they copy it and the, more, the day after, you find it on Taobao, which is, you know, sort of Amazon, Chinese Amazon, and you can buy it. Mm -hmm. When I asked him, Lino, why don't you, why aren't you afraid? You know what was the answer? The answer is, was, well, if they can make it, I actually shake their hands and tell them, good boy. <laughs> because yeah. what he does is so difficult that he doesn't care. So it's so special in ways that it's, you know, it's profound. This is unique case. He's uh, he's one case that I think only one percent or five percent are like this that they're unique and uncopyable. Because come on, what is uncopyable today? I take it, I scan it, three D print. Exactly. I... But the, the point is that what can be copied? Hmm, what I'm trying. Anything can be copied. Well, yeah, we we couldn't. We shouldn't be that concerned yeah. with what we can copy because to some extent there are certain things whose value cannot be copied. Mm. Uh, and of course, you know, once again, I don't want to say that, that we should have no limits or boundaries. Mm. I'm, just trying yes, of course. To, I'm just trying to shake the tree a little bit because we yes. are so firmly rooted in the idea that copyright protects artists that we cannot think otherwise. When I say these things, people think I'm crazy, that I hate artists, that, uh, you know... Uh, I am, you know, like with a friend like you, artists don't need an, not, don't need an enemy. I actually <laughs> think it's quite the opposite uh, because, you know, there are infinite cases of artists that are not affluent that actually suffer from copyright yeah. protection because copyright protection serves those with money, not those with no money. And I think that there are alternatives there could be alternatives that we could implement so that you have that degree of protection that we consider right, you prevent or fight against commercial exploitation and appropriation. Uh, you put some boundaries mm, to, uh, you know, what you can well, adapt or steal from others. Uh, I mean, that could be, a, you know, that could be a, a discussion. Actually, that should be a discussion. The discussion shouldn't be, can we apply copyright or not? Because copyright, yeah. as it stands, to me, it's so far away from the principles animating the practice of graffiti that it will basically, and what I say, it's, it will kill it. Huh? It's like, you know, you, you put a plant in, in, a, in, a, in a vase that, you know, you take a tree, you put it in a plant and the tree dies because the vase doesn't have enough ground. And I think yeah, that's, that's what happens with copyright. Copyright is thought, understood, developed in ways that are so distant from graffiti that it cannot fit. As much as you try, it's like to fit the, the star in the circle. It's not going to get inside. It can be, or maybe the yeah. circle inside of the star, even better. Yeah. Copyright is based on the idea of property. If anyone, any artistic practice has challenged the idea of property, together perhaps with performance art, is of course graffiti. And I think in the most radical way we have seen in the history of art, but in, you know, that might be the Kaiser, you know, in the history of, you know, recent culture, at least contemporary culture. Surely there is a refusal of common understanding of private property or property in general. And I find that refreshing and interesting and, uh, you know, a, a way of making meaning, of showing that property is not natural, that property is something that we invented. The fact that, that I own a piece of land Seems sounds natural to us, and that's the problem because it's not natural, it's a way in which we came to understand how we can regulate and deal with the world. Borders, borders are not natural, right? Yeah, I agree. Um, uh, and the point is that they we become so used to these ideas that it becomes impossible almost to think about alternatives. So, what I'm trying to say is that listen. Let's try to figure it out an alternative. 
together. I'm not trying, I've never said that I have the perfect solution. Again, I'm a skeptic in the sense I'm a person who raises doubts. If I had solutions, I'd be a politician. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> but, but the idea is that, again, because of the association between copyright and iHeart, money, cultural recognition, graffiti writers often are buying to that idea because it seems to validate what they are doing. And I said this very clearly. Graffiti writers were doing something interesting, something valuable, even before copyright law had graffiti on the radar. It's not mm -hmm. validating anything. Whether or not something is copyrightable or not doesn't make it good. There is a lot of stuff that can be copyrighted, and it's just a pile of shit. Yeah, yeah, but for sure, this copyright has nothing to do with quality. This is just uh, this is just low and way to get money. I mean, like you know, there is an article, for instance, of Sonia Rao when she says exactly this. Mm? The, now the law is taking graffiti seriously. Which law? The copyright law or the law in general? The law in general. The world is taking the the copy, you know, graffiti seriously. Yeah, because more and more money because because becoming an industry. This is it. Yeah, no, but again, <laughs> it's it's simply as this. Things get serious when there is money. When there is no money, nobody cares. Who will care about implying uh, copyrights? Nobody will hear about it. But now, when there is a full multi-million industry running with exhibitions, uh, programs, uh, institutional programs, and whatever budgets for this and that, for sure, like now, it's getting interesting. <laughs> yeah. And again, this is something that I think has to be said. Uh, part of what I try to do is to say, listen, if you go that way, then it's what the world you're going to live in. Is that what you want? If that's what you want, I mean, I'm not the king of anything. So, yeah. you know. Me, I am the king of everything. <laughs> <laughs> you can do whatever. <laughs> out, out of my way. <laughs> But just realize where we're going. I am concerned because I am concerned that all forms of creativity have to be monetized. Man, if everything goes to copyright, it's going to be disgusting, you know? It's like the moment when everything starts to apply, I tell you, it's going to be like, yeah, you have to submit the form V77 to, uh, to say where you're going to paint, what you're going to paint. Then you submit a picture and in three weeks you are submitted. Then it's like somebody who has painted before, but it has been whitewashed. And, but you didn't know that you basically recover, but he said, yeah, you recover me. There was a white layer of paint, but under this, my copyrights are under layer of white or gray paint. And then comes the buffer with his bucket and with his mustache. And he said, hey, um, what about my copyrights? I paint here and the city is paying me, but what about I also make art? And then it's like a completely machine gun in the courtroom, but yeah. This is in, just in, inside my head. <laughs> I don't know how many of the uh, you know, listeners are aware of how pervasive copyright limitations are becoming today. I'll give you another example. I have a friend of mine who's an a academic in Denmark, in Copenhagen. Before she actually shows a, a PPT to her students, she has what to is run this PowerPoint, PowerPoint presentation, yeah, you mean? PowerPoint, yeah. Like a slideshow. She yeah. has to run it through the copyright office to see if what she's using actually violates no. copyright. No. So the point is that she's not putting any images anymore in her, in her PowerPoint, in her slideshows, because otherwise she always has to get into a fight with these things. Can oh, you imagine when I, have, you know, when I put... Uh, so I have, for instance, in the, in the piece for the Cambridge... Uh, handbook of uh, copywriting street art and graffiti. I have a few pictures from Fra 32's band on all things done illegally. So these are done yeah. anonymously. And, and Cambridge wants an authorization signed that they give me the copyright. And it's like, but you know, they don't want to tell you who they are <laughs> because yeah. otherwise it's an omission of the fact that they committed a violation. Yeah. That they were very nice, I have to say. They were super nice. It was just enough an email when they were, you know, everything was canceled, all details. They say it's okay. But what if we push copyright 
and in, on graffiti and street art more forcefully, and then I cannot even put a picture in a book about graffiti if the art, you know, the graffiti writer doesn't reveal his name and signs. Well, this basically it's yeah, but okay. It's not possible also to find every author, you know. If you're writing about graffiti, you cannot find, let's say, Moses. Go find Moses. You know, how do you find him? Or some other writer who is completely anonymous. How do you find it? You cannot find it, but you want to write about him. What is the problem to illustrate? But then it comes to him because he will say, yeah, why are you writing and using my artworks? And this is it's the paradox, you know. It's just it's never-ending loop. It's like, yeah... Then I have a better solution. Let's just stop graffiti. <laughs> Great idea. <laughs> then we have no fucking problem. It's like, you know, me and my girlfriend, we are fighting. And then I say, okay, let's stop speak speaking. And then it's okay. Let's do the same. We just stop graffiti. Oh, and we can stop copyright. Will be... Ah, maybe better idea. Uh, this is why you are the clever person. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we keep graffiti. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Andrea, uh, let's finish this because it was two hours. I would like to put it in one piece together. Do you have anything to say as a epilogue? Well, you know, just to conclude again, what I try to suggest has nothing to do with uh, a desire to keep things the old way. Things will never go back to old school. So it's never going to be a world where you can ignore the issue of copyright, commercial appropriation. It is a world where we have to face it. Now, there are two options. One is you let corporations run the business, and then all of a sudden, bit by bit, you find yourself in a world where you cannot even use your own <laughs> picture. Or... <laughs> Or yeah. you take the fight head on, you take the fight to them, and you actually push for legal, legal reformation, legal changes. Now, of course, the second option is tough. And it might not be, you know, there, nobody expects to produce a uh, legislation regulating creativity, protecting creativity that is perfect. But what I'm trying to say is that the system as it shows its limitation in, in the case of graffiti writing, is broken. And it's a something that understands the creativity only in terms of money. And we have to finish that. Creativity is something that must reach the lives, the everyday lives of everybody. And this, is, should, this should be protected. It's not the interest of a handful of artists. They are wealthy and recognized enough to go to court and to protect what they do. I think that the, what a legal system should do is to protect my right to express myself, my right to enjoy creativity in my everyday life. Hmm? Consider, you know, what we are experiencing in, during the lockdown. How would the world be if we couldn't enjoy what we can enjoy? Uh, and again, the extension of copyright makes the world of circulation of knowledge and creativity always smaller and smaller and smaller. So my idea is that let's pull a, you know, put a nail in the wall and take down the wall. Yeah. Thank you very much, Andrea. Thank you very much for your time. It, uh, it was a big, big uh, pleasure to have you. It was very interesting. I hope people would uh, pay attention to uh, what you said. And uh, I hope most of it that uh, it, uh, it will actually not only make the people listen, but the, to make the people who listen think about it and start to open the dialogue about this thing in all around the world. Speaking not to go out and to protest about the copyrights of graffiti, of course, but... Uh, It's just something that sooner or later it might be influencing anybody who is working with graffiti and street art. If you're just painting out there on the street, I don't think this concerns you. I think for this type of listeners, they don't have any problem as long as they don't want to search for copyright uh, uh, refunds. 
But for the people who are taking this professionally, I think it's interesting for them and it's favor of everybody that there is there is this solution, of course, if you care. Because also the cases are not so many that are happening, the big cases. But uh, it's it's a very interesting material, at least for me. I hope uh, interesting for the listeners. And uh, that's it. Okay. Thank you very it much. It was a great Corey. conversation. Absolutely. I thank you. Absolutely my pleasure. So we can say... I wish you a nice afternoon. To you, too, Boris. <laughs> Say yeah. hi to your girlfriend wherever she is. Yeah. Don't fight with yeah. her. <laughs> no, no, only one time per week. <laughs> okay, so we I will cut here the the, okay. the, the podcast the podcast. Thanks to Andrea for this lovely talk and thank you for going this far listening the full conversation. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed it. I will continue the topic of copyright, graffiti copyright and uh, street art in the next talks. For more information about Andrea's work, you can check the links provided in the description. And if you want to hear more about the Influencer podcast, follow the Grifters on all social media, subscribe to the newsletters of the Grifters and see you soon.